Welcome to the Explorer series. Brought to you by the NSF National Center for Atmospheric Research. With funding support from the National Science Foundation. Your host for today, Evie. With assistance from Elizabeth and Aaliyah. Technical support from Fletcher and Christopher. Special guest today, Dr. Mei Wong. Now here's your host, Evi. Whether you are here with us at the Mesa Lab or joining us virtually from everywhere in the world, thank you for sharing your time with us today for this Explorer series, Inside a Weather Modeling System, What Can Go Wrong? with Dr. Mei Wong. I am Dr. Evie McCumber, and I am an educator here at the National Science Foundation's National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NSF NCAR. NSF NCAR is a world-leading organization that is dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I am really glad that y'all are joining us today to learn more about all of the factors that work together to improve our weather models. For this event, you'll be able to ask May questions following the lecture, and Olia will help moderate so we can ensure that we hear both from all of y'all in person and our virtual audience. If you're in person, it's very easy. You raise your hand, we will give you a microphone and give you time to ask your question. If you're joining us virtually, you can ask your questions using the Slido platform. If you scroll down this webpage, you can see this Slido window. Just below, you are seeing the live stream video of this event. If you haven't already, go ahead and click on the green Join Event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab. May has also a few poll questions with us. I see that our word cloud there is happening, which is great. Um, so for both our in-person and virtual audience, you can respond on Slido. For those in person, go ahead. You can use your phone or laptop to navigate to slido.com and enter the code hashtag Explorer Series. And definitely, which you all have done, make sure you join it to add your thoughts to our word cloud question. What do you think of when you hear the words weather models? Because May is going to get to that really soon. I'm giving her time to look at the answers so we can have a good discussion. This event is also being recorded and will be available on the NSF and Car Explorer Series website soon enough. With us today, we have NSF and Car scientist Dr. Mei Wong. Dr. Mei Wong is a project scientist in the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Laboratory at NSF and Car. Her research focuses on the practical predictability of deep convection and ways to improve its represent representation in models. Driven by her interest in numerical modeling techniques, she has worked on topics that are related to explicit scalar and subgrid scale hydrometeor transport schemes, sensitivity of prediction skills to initial conditions, and the purpose of today, improving model error diagnosis. To help disentangle sources of model errors related to convection, she uses data assimilation systems and takes advantage of their inherent need to routinely evaluate short forecasts against assimilated observations. Within the systems, she implemented detailed model diagnostics to help track model behavior and in identify fast physics errors in need of improvement. Um, Dr. Wog moved to Boulder, Colorado and joined NCAR in 2015 as a postdoctoral researcher after earning her PhD in atmospheric science from the University of British Columbia in 2014 and spending a year as a postdoctoral scientist at the DOE Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. That is how accomplished Dr. May is. Um, before I turn it over to May, let's check out your thoughts on our word cloud. Thanks, Fletcher and Christopher, for sharing it. Um, I see that forecasting is the biggest um, word that they have shared. Um, I'm going to give you the podium. What do we think? Oh, Lorenz. There are some scientists in here that <laughs> added that <laughs> very, very clever answer. You now have the podium. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Evie. 
Um, hi, everyone. I'm May, and I'm so excited today to talk to you and take you on a journey in, inside a weathering modeling system, what can go wrong. And thank you for sharing your thoughts about what you think of um, when you first hear about weather models. I love that the majority of people do connect weather models with forecasting. We also use weather models a lot for research purposes, like really to further understand the physical processes that govern the evolution of the atmosphere. A lot of people also pointed out computer, computers, that's great. And we'll touch on Lorenz a little bit, but not a lot, because this is about um, forecast accuracy, forecast skill, and how we use a weather modeling system. OK, let's start a trip inside a weather modeling system and what can go wrong. So it's obvious that we can use weather models to produce forecasts. So it's going to be helpful to tell us, is it going to rain tomorrow? Or is it going to pour tomorrow, more importantly? So it's these more extreme events um, that could help emergency managers and forecasters alike to produce these um, warnings and watches for the public to better prepare themselves for disastrous events, such as the hurricane that's happening over in Florida right now as we gather here. Um, so we did the word cloud. I'm really excited to see that most people connect weather models to computers. Because that takes us back to how numerical weather prediction all started in the very beginning. It started when the first large-scale computer model was born in 1946. And really, that invention has really kicked off a lot of different numerical problems uh, in the sciences that we can solve, including the atmosphere. So in the very early days, the atmospheric, an atmospheric model is super simple. So imagine the whole atmosphere from surface to tens of kilometers um, for the, in the troposphere is all represented with just a couple of layers in the, in the model, vertical layers in the model. Nowadays, a typical operational weather forecasting model has about over 100 vertical levels. So we have come a really long way. And because it uses uh, so few layers and, and the equations are simplified because of just the computers being not as advanced, um, there's a lot of physical approximations that go in it. In fact, early on in, in the early days, there weren't even clouds in these global atmospheric models. But that is not true, rest assured, nowadays. Um, in the 70s, I think, is really when weather models really kicked off, is with the development and advancement um, of being able to model three-dimensional thunderstorms on a computer. Um, so these required advanced numerical methods. And these are still really idealized cases in the sense that there's no surface really topography, so your mountains, terrains, uh, it's not in the model. And the domain is periodic. That means what goes out on the edge there will loop around uh, the other way around. But you can see it's actually very realistic. So we definitely got a lot of the physics right. Um, some of the physics are still rather simple. For example, there's no ice water uh, in, in these models in the early days. But with faster and faster computers, we're able to further increase the resolution of our models, as well as include very, uh, more sophisticated physics. Um, so this is just an example of uh, how fast, for example, in clouds, water vapor would condense into cloud liquid, and the processes of converting into cloud ice and graupel and other species. Um, so I believe now there's a Slido question coming up. Um, so which of these our names for numerical weather modeling systems. And I found it interesting that our audience seems to be very well attuned to so many of these um, and that they did not select STARS, which is interesting because STARS is a satellite system rather than a weather model. Um, and May, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about some of these numerical weather modeling prediction systems. Yes. Indeed, I know. and I'm also really happy to see that WARF is on the top of that list because WARF is de was developed here at NCAR. In fact, currently, we have over 20 weather modeling systems in the world, and probably more than that. Um, these are just some examples of uh, uh, where they're located and where they're developed, different research groups. Um, at, at NCAR, uh, the two main weather modeling systems that was developed here is WARF, which every, most people got correctly, um, which stands for Weather Research and Forecasting Model. It's arguably one of the most, um, uh, arguably one of the most well, uh, mostly used weather model used for research and forecasting purposes around the world. 
Its successor, which is the model for prediction across scales, the A stands for atmospheric component, uh, AMPAS, um, is our uh, rather, uh, well, it's a successor for WARF, and it's a global atmospheric model that we can conduct really high resolution uh, weather forecasts. Go ahead. We have a question. Uh, oh, you might need a. South of the equator. Oh, yeah. Australia. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the Australian uh, Australians also has their own um, weather model that I didn't include here. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Of course, let's talk, let's talk about what can go wrong in weather models. Um, but first, I'd like to highlight um, the improvements in prediction capability that's ha already happened over the past decades. Um, so this is a plot showing how good we, we performed um, in five-day forecasts of what different weather patterns over the last 40 years or so, from the 80s till current day. You can see there's a gradual increase in the forecast ac accuracy uh, amongst many different models, and some of them listed here were shown on the map on the previous slide. Um, and on average, we actually gain one day of forecast skill per 10 uh, years. Um, so it's gradual, but it's happening in particular, in 2000s, you'll notice that we have a slight uptick in the prediction skill, and that's largely due to the better utilization and inclusion of satellite measurements that I'll um, talk more about later. Well, there's certainly still challenges with predicting at small spatial scales. So here is uh, a rainfall map of observed um, accumulated precipitation uh, over a 24-hour period. Uh, I just picked a day in last spring, so that's when a lot of uh, thunderstorms happened um, over the central U.S. And you can see that there is indeed a, a, a lots of heavy thunderstorms that are happening over Tennessee region here, as well as a line of thunderstorms that's happening in Missouri. For a low resolution, uh, for a low resolution atmospheric model, you can see that, well, okay, for the one-day forecast, it looks like largely the placement of the thunderstorms are correct. Um, but if you look at the, where the purple colors indicating heavier precipitation is happening, eh, not so good. Um, it still got some of uh, the precipitation that was happening over Tennessee correctly, but if you look at Missouri, um, there was basically no indication of a heavier um, rainfall happening there. But when we increase the resolution of the model, so this is a, a higher resolution model run by NOAA, um, and this is actually a model, a version um, based off of WARF, the one that was developed here at NCAR. Now you can see the performance is much better. Uh, it captured the higher precipitation intensity over Tennessee. And even though the shape of this, uh, the, the heavy rainfall area is a little bit off, it still was able to capture that heavy precipitation event over Missouri. So what is a high resolution model? Well, that takes us to the backbone of a weather model, the modeling grid. So essentially, the resolution of the model is defined by the size of your grid cell on this, in the weather model. The smaller the grid cells, the higher the resolution. The larger the grid cells, the coarser, the, the lower the resolution. So if you have particular areas of interest, like North America, for instance, we probably want to put higher resolution because our models will perform better there and provide, be able to provide better forecasts. So I think here is our... Yeah, we have a slider question sure. that is asking about how many types of grids can be used when creating models like the MPAS. And I think most of the folks here have chosen seven or more. Um, but May, are those different kinds of grids or what are actual grids when we look at these models? What are grids? Yeah, so grids are essentially like the one that I showed earlier for a model for prediction across scales. It's really how we define where to put, put our atmospheric variables on and how do we want to solve um, and predict the weather. So maybe I'll show you what some other grids might look like that's different from the one that I just showed for MPAS. So the majority of the participants were correct. There's definitely seven and a lot more uh, of different types of modeling grids. So you can see the grid cells shown in these different types of grids all have different shapes and sizes. The majority of them is trying to avoid a problem called the pole problem in this latitude-longitude grid. So you can see the grid cell sizes are getting smaller and smaller towards the North Pole here. Um, and that actually makes our computer models run slower. 
And to try to avoid that problem, since our areas of interest is typically over where we try to produce a forecast for, uh, you can see that the rest of the other options, uh, what they try to do is um, for the grid cells to look more uniform. And in the case of model for prediction across scales, the model here in the center, we're trying to increase the resolution to even better predict the forecast there. So they all have um, different sizes of the grid cells. And actually, the way the grid um, is set up also dictates uh, several properties of your weather model. Uh, for example, how fast can you run the, the weather model, um, and also how smooth the fields might look um, because of how you calculate some of the fields and terms. Um, so the modeling grid does uh, define some of the properties, unique properties. But there is one commonality uh, over all of these different modeling grids, and is that they all try to represent the atmosphere using a single grid, vertical grid column. And we, what, by representing what I mean is we want to know what the in atmospheric variables of interest are over this grid column. So these variables would be horizontal winds, vertical wind, temperature, density, and any water species. So like liquid water or cloud, uh, cloud ice. Um, we want to get the answer over this grid column. So how do we get the answer to this grid column? How do we know what the variables are? So I promised you this is the only slide with equations that I'm going to show tonight. Um, and this is actually a simplified version of the governing equations of each weather model. So each weather model will have a different set of governing equations. So these equations might look a little different. But in general, they're all based on the equations of motion. And the equations of motion um, consist of moment the momentum equations, which tells you how fast the winds change with time and the driving forces behind that. The thermodynamic equation, which tells you how fast the temperature changes with time and the driving forces behind that. And then other laws of physics, like conservation of mass, conservation of water mass, and the equation of state, which is based on the ideal gas law. So these terms here, uh, these d, du, dt, dw, dt, tells you how fast that variable changes with time. And if you move all those other terms into the right-hand side of the equation, that's how we get the answer of how these variables changes with time as our atmosphere evolves. Um, and, that, and the type of processes that we typically include in a weather model includes uh, resolve processes. So these are processes you can directly calculate using the atmospheric state in that grid column, and it'll give you these the answers to these driving forces and how it changes winds, temperature, uh, water mass, et cetera. And so these processes include transport, so winds moving, say, a cloud, blob of cloud moisture uh, across uh, the United States, uh, pressure gradient force that tells you how the, the direction of the flows um, and governs the flow changes, and other transport terms for uh, temperature and other masses. But there's another type of processes uh, that we include in, uh, in our weather model. And these are called parametrized processes. So these are processes that changes temperature, winds, and moisture in our, in our atmosphere, but we can't resolve it. Um, in other words, we can't directly calculate it using the grid column values that already have. Um, and what we do is we try to include other types of models to represent how fast these processes change as a temperature profile or a moisture profile. So these type of processes include boundary layer processes or cloud processes um, and also mixing uh, effects. So here's a really simple schematic of cloud formation and how it looks in a weather model. So we have three grid columns, and the, the, there's a low pressure system up there with a the, the trough um, that we can nicely resolve in our weather model. So we have the, the horizontal wind values to, to show that. And we calculate our resolve flow. This is due to transport, and this is what happens. A low pressure system aloft uh, typically drives an uprising motion closer to the surface. Uh, so all of these we can see in our grid column values. We can resolve it. But then there might be clouds forming because of this uprising mo motion. And these clouds are smaller than the grid scale. So we can't really resolve this process, and we rely on these physics, uh, different parameters physics to generate these clouds for us in the weather model. And then these clouds might also rain. The other thing that we can't always resolve in our grid model is the valleys and peaks that, are, that are, exist within a, grid, uh, within a grid box, within a grid cell. 
So a typical weather model grid cell is three kilometers by three kilometers. So certainly there's a lot of variation in terrain within the grid column. And a model actually takes in the mean statistics of those terrain effects. And so you can see that typically a weather model will have an underrepresentation of the terrain effects if the, if the grid cells gets too big. So the model resolution gets too uh, low. So that was a simplified um, kind of depiction of physical processes that are typically included. Here's a more comprehensive look of what um, scientists have found to be dominant processes that we need to include in a weather model in order to capture the evolution of the atmosphere properly. So for example, shortwave radiation essentially turns, uh, tells you the energy from the sun, um, how it, during the daytime, it could heat up the land surface, drives mixing in the boundary layer that's closer to the surface, so that's a turbulent diffusion. The sun's energy can also heat up the ocean and lead to evaporation, and then the evaporation could lead to cloud formation there that might rain a little bit. But you can see how now they, these different processes start to interact with each other because the clouds could also reflect sunlight off the cloud top. It also emits long wave radiation. They're also, when I mentioned earlier, when the grid cells get too big, um, it can't generate clouds on its own. So we need uh, a way to represent the processes of uh, convection or thunderstorms, deep convection, which is another word for thunderstorms. So these processes are represented by schemes in the weather model that basically tells us what is the impact of these physical processes on the temperature and the moisture profile rate in every single grid column uh, in the weather model. And essentially in a weather model, we first compute the resolved processes, which is due to transport, um, pressure gradient force, Coriolis force, et cetera. So we have a grid column of values. We feed that into these schemes, and these schemes tell us how these processes change as the temperature and moisture profile, and we repeat this many, many times uh, to create a weather simulation. And this consists of one time step in the weather model. Just for reference, for a high resolution model that's about three kilometer grid spacing, uh, one day forecast, you need to loop through this over 4,000 times. So this is why we need a really large computer. So that looks like a lot of physical processes that we're including. So why are our models still getting it wrong? People are saying that it could be near the poles, that there could be issues with lack of observed data. Um, and these are all, if, we, if I scroll down, if we scroll, we can see a lot of answers oh, here. Um, and they're all very thought provoking. Um, May, do you have any of these challenges that resonate with you? Particularly, yes, I, I am. I'm very impressed. I think um, I think the audience already knows the answer. I can probably go. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, this is wonderful. Yes, um, in fact, yes, um, a lot of them actually um, resonate with me, like data sparse regions, initial conditions, um, upstream unknowns. Um, yeah, this is fantastic, and this is exactly what I'm going to talk more about. Some some folks mentioned initial conditions. Um, which is fantastic because essentially solving the equation of motion um, is an initial and boundary value problem. What, is, what this means is for an initial value problem, we need to know uh, accurately the current state of the atmosphere in order to predict the future. Um, it's a boundary value problem because we need to, the topography or vegetation type um, has a huge influence on what our weather looks like over that exact region. Um, so it's really important to resolve these things properly. The other thing is feedback among, among physical processes. So there's still a lot of uncertainty in how a lot of these physical processes work. And also there's a lot of approximation that goes into um, approximating how does the cloud generation, how does the cloud population impact temperature changes or moisture changes in our atmosphere. And the third thing is, um, that the atmosphere, in essence, is a chaotic system. So that means a small change or small error can propagate and grow with time pretty quickly. Um, and so that also makes it really challenging to forecast farther and farther out into the future. And that's why our seven-day forecast might look a little bit uh, worse than our, say, next-day forecast. So what are we doing to improve the models? Um, first thing is, 
there are more and more observations that are being used in our weather modeling system nowadays. Um, and that has really helped tremendously, not only to verify, to see if our models are doing it right, but also to improve our forecast. And I'll talk more a little bit. But first, I'd like to show you um, the types of observations that are actually used in weather forecasting systems uh, in current day. So these are locations of where uh, weather balloons are launched to measure the vertical profile of temperature um, and moisture and winds. Um, these are different types of surface observations. And you can see that most of them uh, occur over land. Um, uh, over the ocean, we do have some measurements um, from ships and buoys. So these are some examples. And you can really see the ship tracks from these measurements. Um, and then there's also instrumentation over commercial aircraft that kind of feed back into our current, uh, into our weather forecasting systems as well. Uh, yeah. Do all ships and aircraft? Sure. The Sorry. question is, um, do all ships and aircraft have instruments on board? Um, I do not believe so, but um, I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is, Satellites. And I mentioned earlier how they're in the 2000s. That's really helped improve our ability to predict um, weather. And that's really because of the, the spatial coverage that it provides. Granted, this is actually accumulated observations. All of these are accumulated options, observations uh, points over one and a half month. Um, but uh, so in reality, perhaps uh, in time, you would see swaths of this, the satellite measurements versus a complete picture like this. But really, it helps provide a lot of the global coverage that was missing in other types of measurements and has really improved the weather forecasting capability, especially in the southern hemisphere, too. So I think here's another Slido question coming up. How many observations are being used in making weather forecasts each day? I think you mentioned that we use 4,000 for like one day. For a small grid, but if we can see what our audience says about, yeah, so we have 10 million, 1 billion, all of those are very <gasps> large numbers, nice. so much processing power. Can you get it a little bit into which ones is it? Yeah, um, actually, in a daily, uh, tens of millions of observations are ingested into weather forecasting systems every day. And most of that is satellite measurements. So it's that coverage that we talked about. Um, and in fact, there's actually hundreds of millions of observations that were made each day and, and collected each day. Uh, but a lot of them are quality controlled. So they, they're being discarded and not used. Um, so great job. <laughs> So the other thing we're doing to better model the weather is to, like I mentioned earlier, to increase the, the resolution of our, our, of our simulations. And this is made possible um, because of the removal of the physical approximations I mentioned earlier in these early day uh, models. And, and that requires better numerical methods to make to ensure that the model can run successfully um, without encountering numerical stability issues, which I hear the audience mentioned earlier. Um, and then they can better represent the boundary value, um, boundary conditions that, that we need to better represent terrain features, um, and also clouds and <laughs> clouds and uh, clouds and precipitation processes. Last slider question of the uh, night. Let's see what folks say. And it is all about what are some benefits of running at high resolution. Which, if I understand that right, may it would be like zooming in on a weather model, and. Which would be the correct answers? I, I would assume that you would get faster running models, but I don't know if that's true. Yeah, so um, actually, all, uh, yeah, most of these are correct, except for faster running models. So when we increase the resolution of the model, we're actually putting, over the same region, we're actually putting more grid cells, number of grid cells, and so it actually takes longer. So remember, each grid column, we have to go through all those processes, all those schemes and, and everything, um, and also over 4,000 times for a one-day forecast. Um, so that actually takes uh, longer to run. So the other thing is uh, there's also um, a lot of effort into coupling with other physical processes, like the ocean, which already exists uh, for, for many weather models. 
Um, but this is found to be important, especially for things like hurricane forecasting, um, as well as coupling to the, atmos uh, to the atmospheric chemistry uh, to better forecast for air, pol uh, air pollution, making air pollution and air quality forecasts. And the last thing about the sensitivity to small changes and small errors um, that exist in our atmospheric system is the better capture of model and forecast uncertainty. And you may have seen spaghetti plots um, before. And essentially what these are, are changing the initial conditions just slightly to account for the uncertainty that we have in the initial conditions and then launch forecasts uh, to see how they uh, look. And so if the model output at the very end there, there's a large spread among the different solutions, that means that we're less certain about uh, that forecast at that time. So now I'm going to switch gears in just a little bit and talk about diagnosing model error using best estimate of the atmosphere. So how do we obtain that best estimate of the atmosphere? So you saw that we have tens and hundreds of millions of observations that we collect every day. How do we actually use that in a weather modeling system? So say we have this temperature, maybe it's a mean temperature over a region and how it changes with time. So we'll never be able to capture the truth, but observations, let's assume it does a pretty good job. So there's a technique called data simulation that scientists have developed that help combine the information from observations with a first guess from a forecast model. So this first guess could be a really short forecast. So it has some 3D information of the atmosphere. It then uses the data simulation technique to combine it with the observation and corrects it towards the observations. And then it generates something called an analysis. So the analysis is the best estimate that we can get um, uh, of the atmosphere. And it's going to be three-dimensional, which is great for um, also validating our weather models. And then this analysis is then used to launch a really short forecast using the weather model to generate our next first guess forecast, which again, using the data simulation technique, then it gets pushed towards what the observations are saying. Uh, it's an almost like an, it's an optimization problem. And it generates the next analysis at the next interval. And in operational weather centers, they do this continuously at regular intervals. So now you can see the green dots basically gives us sort of a continuous capture of what our best estimate of the atmosphere looks like. And these green dots can then be used as initial conditions to launch a forecast, to run our forecast using a weather model. Now, in this exaggerated version, our weather model actually is doing a pretty bad job because you can see it's consistently too cold. And that's such a systematic error uh, often leads to a drift or a forecast drift in our, in our um, forecast. So, uh, this is, again, why the longer the forecasts uh, we look at, the more uncertainty there is. And this uncertainty is also uh, complicated by the fact that there's a lot of uh, feedback between all those physical processes that we saw earlier that's represented in the model, and that's get iterated time and time again. So wrong if there's something wrong in one part of the model, that could get fed into other parts and interact with other parts of the physics, uh, and that kind of... Um, and over many, many time steps, it's really hard to diagnose the sources of those errors. But luckily, there have been studies that have shown that model errors at early forecast lead times have similar characteristics as those found in longer simulations. Well, this is great if this is true because these shorter forecasts are faster to run so we can diagnose uh, problems and check for any errors uh, faster um, and, and yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's great. So I'm going to take you to an example of this. Uh, we're going to look at the, the performance of capturing the daily cycle of precipitation in the U.S. So essentially, there's a really robust signal over the central U.S. Uh, in the springtime where there's, you probably noticed that in Colorado, we often get afternoon thunderstorms. And whether you look at three-year statistics, which is in the top plot here, or 10-year statistics, which is in the bottom plot here, um, these, uh, the signals are really robust. So these red spots here indicate heavy rainfall. So these are the afternoon thunderstorms. Uh, the y-axis shows time, which increases downwards. And you can see a lot of these uh, storms happen in the late, early after, uh, late afternoon, late afternoon, early evening um, over the Rockies. They're usually over the Rockies, and they propagate eastwards. 
And there are also ones over the central, uh, central plains here. So we want to see if our model captures this. And this is really nice because it's a robust signal. It's a good metric to see if our model is able to kind of integrate all the different physical processes and dynamics and be able to still show uh, and st be able to show this signal here. So here's our two models, okay? This is in, in this case study. There's just two models. Uh, we have an original model shown in the blue line. The black line is observation. So there's our two-day forecast. And you see this nice diurnal cycle, this daily cycle of precipitation. And this is our peak precipitation in the late afternoon, early evening. So we have our original model that, uh, yeah, the timing is not great. So it often predicts it too early, which is very common in these lower resolution models, 15 kilometer grid spacing. And in the red line shows the improved model. We change the way how clouds are populated in our weather model. And the goal is we, we, know, we, we, we know that it should improve the timing. And oh, great, it does show up in our two-day forecast, okay? Um, you also see that there's an overprediction of precipitation here. Uh, yeah, that's not good. Um, so we, we might want to look into that. The other thing that we should look into is sometimes we want to look at, you know, we're trying to improve precipitation forecast. But what often happens in model development is it messes something else up. So we want to make sure we're not messing up temperature, our moisture, our, the other variables that we care about also. So here we're going to look at shorter forecasts. OK, does it show the same statistics? OK, it does. OK, good. It, it still improves the time, even though we're running only six-hour forecast, not a 24-hour forecast. Um, oh, sorry, 40, 48 hour forecast. And yes, we see improvement in the timing and even captures that overprediction. Okay, good. So maybe we can kind of look a little bit more into this using these six hour forecasts. So here's our forecast verification. So verification is comparing your um, is comparing your model output with observations um, and checking the difference. So that'll tell us the error. We're going to look at temperature and moisture, and these are vertical profiles, uh, average over an area. So if it's on the left of the uh, zero line here, it's too cold. If it's still on the right of the, uh, the zero line here, it's too warm compared to observations. And then similarly for the moisture, if it's to the left of the zero line, it's too dry, and to the right is too much moisture. So again, the, the blue line shows the original model and the red line shows the improved model. Okay, let's look at the results here. All right, here you see that the red line is closer to the zero line. That's good, we improved it. Okay, that's good. And that's kind of expected too, because that's where the clouds have the, a lot of the impact in terms of the heating and the moisture rate. So that's kind of expected. Um, closer to the surface, that's, uh, yeah, the biases seem to be a lot worse in the newer model. And again, like I said, this is, this is what commonly happens. Like you try to improve one aspect, but then now you mess this up another. So let's see if we can figure this out. But first let's try to figure out Let's look into what's actually changed and how, like, what has changed. Um, so convection scheme. So convection scheme is used to uh, help populate the weather model with clouds that it can't do on its own. Um, so in this case, like I said, in a 15-kilometer grid spacing model, that's what we typically rely on. So how it does this, as I mentioned earlier, but now we have an in-depth example of one physics scheme of how this does, how this works. In a single grid column over the whole uh, region, it first gets the resolved state. So we have this grid column value. It then, um, based on some resolved feature, for example, moisture convergence, so how much moisture is converging in this grid column, it then decides whether to trigger a cloud. So it could be a really deep cloud in this grid column, or it could be a really shallow cloud in this. Only one exists, though. The only shallow cloud in this grid column. And then it might rain if it's a deep enough cloud, so it's a thunderstorm. And then also based on the temperature and moisture profile, it also calculates the cloud base and the cloud top, and then gets the cloud depth. And using this cloud depth, it then assigns whether or not to start a trigger a deep, a deep thunderous cloud or a shallow popcorn looking shallow cloud. And based on the assignment of the type of cloud, then it computes uh, the mass fluxes and gets, gives you the heating and moistening rate and how that affects the atmospheric state in that grid column. Uh, and also any precipitation. So let's look at those two models. Uh, the original scheme looks like it's saying that over the region of interest, there's a lot more shallow clouds, so that's shown in blue, than the 
um, improved model, which says that most of it should be deep clouds. So shallow clouds does impact the surface profile, um, so the temperature and moisture profile. So maybe, maybe it's doing something right after all. Maybe we're messing it up. Um, it says there's more shallow clouds. So, okay, so we then compared it with observations. So these are satellite observations of cloud top pressure. Um, since we know the assignment of the types of clouds depends on the cloud depth. So in the top plot here shows what the original model says. And the, it's saying, yes, there's a lot more shallow clouds than deep clouds. Um, but then if you look at the observations, which is shown in um, blue here, uh, this is actually over-predicted. Whereas if you look at the improved model, hey, it's actually doing it right. Um, yeah, so, so that's not the issue. So it wasn't really how we generate the clouds that affected the surface errors um, in temperature and moisture. Well, it turns out there is something called compensating errors when we do diagnosis of the errors. Um, actually, it's an accounting term. Like, it's an, like if there's an accounting mistake, uh, in, in, you know, if you're an accountant in the past, like uh, uh, if there's an accounting mistake, it often can be offset by another mistake, um, and then you end up not having, um, not showing up in the final results. And this is sort of what's happening because there's actually a true source of bias somewhere else in the model, um, and that was due to the land surface model um, that fed into the boundary layer with too much moisture. Uh, due to evapotranspiration. That's evaporation of the soil moisture and, and vegetation. Uh, so now the, the, the boundary layer, so the close to the surface, is there's too much moisture. Uh, make, make some clouds. Um, and then the boundary layer scheme would mix it, try to dries it up, dries it up, mixing it vertically. And the shallow convection does the same thing. So in the original model, there was actually too many shallow clouds that led to more shallow mixing, so drying that moist bias, and it led to a better forecast result. Um, and, and that's what the uh, compensating error is, which helped ma actually mask the true source of the bias. Um, so if we fix the, uh, the land surface model in green here, now you show, now we can see that in our six hour forecast, uh, it actually even fixed the precipitation bias that we had. And we still kept the benefit of using that improved model. Um, and if we test this in two day simulations, it works as well, and even in a three kilometer model as well. So that's great. Well, okay. So this example only talks about convection and individual storms. Um, in general, these storms are really important to, to to validate uh, and to verify because um, they really tell you whether the weather model has incorporated and integrated all the physical processes correctly. Um, in reality, these storms, these features, are smaller scales and they're less predictable, uh, which means maybe as a mean statistics, we're able to capture some of the signal, but forecasting each individual storm is really difficult. Um, oops. On the other hand, at larger scale features, um, such as tropical cyclones or mid-latitude systems, um, they're much more predictable and therefore we can rely on them to give you an accurate forecast farther out. But the challenge here is um, these errors, uh, errors across these different uh, spatial scales of phenomena do interact, and there's often a grow of er growth of errors uh, from these smaller scales features to the larger scale. In other words, errors that occur when we try to predict individual storms, which are really difficult to do, um, could have an impact on the predictability of these larger systems, which we typically get it right. So here's an example of... Um, here's an example of what I mean. So why is it so hard to get next week's forecast correct? This is a study, a European study that was done 10 years ago, where they were looking at forecast bus. Forecast bus are essentially um, suddenly a drop in the forecast skill in, for the large scale weather pattern, which we normally expect a lot of skill in. Um, so they looked at day six forecasts and they found uh, these um, larger biases in, in the weather pattern and try to trace it back to see where the source came from. And they actually tracked it back to errors that showed up as early as day two from North America. And they were associated with 
in the storms, the thunderstorms uh, forecast and our, uh, I guess, the mis misrepresentation of these um, convective systems from North America, and they and generally in north uh, in the mid latitudes and north hemisphere, the flow is from west to east. So these errors basically grew in scale and impacted the forecasts uh, over Europe at day six. Well, we see that in our own MPAS simulations too. So here on the right here is North America, and we're looking at largely over the uh, over the Pacific Ocean in most of the plot. There are errors popping up. Um, over uh, the Pacific Ocean. And then you can actually see it growing. And because of the westerly flow, you can see it moving towards North America. And then eventually, eventually turned into this big blob of um, model error of the, of the upper level weather pattern. Um, and also, in this particular case, this was actually um, the forecast for a multi day tornado outbreak event. I mean, we can't, weather models can't resolve tornadoes, but there are, tornadoes are also largely driven. Um, they're also, um, they, you need that large scale forcing for it. So if we can't capture the synoptic forcing for it, um, it's probably really hard to get that farther out into lead time. So we, it's important to figure out where the errors are coming from. So let's see. So the question is, are these initial errors or are these initial condition errors? I mean, it is over a data sparse region where the, over the ocean there's not a lot of observations. Um, or is it physical process errors? It's certainly um, gro a growing mechanism, mechanism of error growth here, and what's causing that and what's leading to that. And then finally, could there be local errors like the one we saw earlier? We really related to land surface model um, pumping out too much moisture from, from the vegetation, um, and that's accumulating with time over the seven day forecast. Well, we can use models like MPAS to figure that out. Um, and scientists are actively doing that. <laughs> so now you know, trying to figure out what the weather model uh, does wrong and also how a weather forecasting system works uh, really incorporates a lot of different um, groups working together. Uh, the observations are really critical, not only to validate our weather models, but also to provide that important initial conditions to drive our weather forecast. Uh, higher resolution simulations also require higher resolution observations to provide that initial condition information. Um, and then with higher resolution simulations, um, that also allows us to better study the feedback among physical processes as well and feedback into the development process. And finally, we, since model errors um, are uh, since our model errors are very sensitive to small changes and small initial errors, uh, we need some um, more robust diagnostic tool to look into error diagnosis, for example, like the example that I showed earlier. And with that, um, there's the references. I'll take any questions now. And for questions, let's give her a hand first. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let me say that I, it's not, it's not, this was an excellent lecture. Oh. I, was, I really loved it. Let me ask you this. With the initial conditions, um, there are going to be, for sure, initial conditions that um, you would need uh, an extremely precise number for. Whereas other, uh, which would be very, almost di very difficult to get a sufficient accuracy to drive the, for the prediction, say, in a, a week out mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, could you talk about that? Are there, are there issues that you've seen uh, in the initial conditions that, aren't going to be able to be um, improved, really, uh, with uh, better and better observations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, I, I think you're right. Like, I mean, no matter how high resolution um, the initial conditions become, by incorporating new instruments, like, for example, radar might be able to capture a lot of higher resolution and kilometer um, 
even hundreds of meters um, observation in a more three-dimensional uh, perspective as well. And that would be helpful in, in, in initializing and studying thunderstorms because that's what's needed, um, some of the moisture, uh, initial content. Um, but yes, generally, you, we would never be able to go down to collecting information on everything at that scale, at the smallest scale. Um, so that's why I think I mentioned briefly is the, the ensemble idea. I think in general for really long forecasts also, even if it's coarser resolution, lower resolution models, um, we would always run ensembles because of just the uncertainty that would grow with your simulation time. And to better capture that uncertainty, you just need to run more members. So this, this is like different forecasts with a slightly different initial conditions. Um, it's perturbed maybe randomly or perturbed in a flow dependent way. So there are different ways to do that and, and that will better capture the uncertainty. Does that answer your question? Very okay. thankful for your question because we have a question online about an initial condition and it's a perfect segue. So if we could please put that question up. I think it also elaborates on what you were asking, which is how do you decide how much you change the initial conditions when mm. you're doing multiple runs? Mm. Um, yeah, there are different ways to do that. Um, with the random perturbations, you could set spatial scales. Um, so maybe you only want to perturb at the larger scale um, or smaller, uh, or in the smaller scale. Um, there are also ways that you could have set up sort of um, relationships in different regions. So you can have also um, get more flow dependent um, perturbations. Yeah. Any other questions in the room before I move online? I also thoroughly enjoyed the lecture, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering whether there are any stochastic elements inside of the model, or whether mm. if you run the model over and over again with exactly the same initial conditions, does it give exactly the same, you know, day one, day two, day three forecast, or is there some variability in that? Thank you very much for that question. Yeah, I did not touch on that. So if you're using the exact same machine, so exact same supercomputer, you should get the identical results, like the solutions. If you run the same, exact same initial conditions, and you use the same model, version of the model and everything, and same machine. But people will notice that if you change, say, at NCAR also, like if you upgrade your supercomputer to a different machine, um, you use the exact same model, but now you compile it on a different machine, it will give you slightly different answers. And those small changes, will have an impact on your longer term, uh, longer range forecast. Um, so you do see that component there. And yeah, you will see some differences um, due to hardware. Is that sort of what you're so, uh, asking? <laughs> Somewhat, I guess I was wondering whether in the kind of <clears throat> physical dynamics, whether is everything handled in a deterministic fashion through those differential equations that, you, that you're solving or whether are there certain things like you mentioned around where under certain conditions the model needs to decide whether or not a cloud spawns or not? Mm. I'm wondering whether there might be some, uh, let's say, marginal situations where actually the relationship between cloud formation and these, you know, ambient conditions is not one to one. Right. You know, there's a lot. Maybe other things that the model isn't capturing, and whether there's a dice that's rolled and right. uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so that would be in the physics scheme. So some physics schemes do account for that. Um, yeah, the stochastic nature of just, you know, population of clouds. It could be different sizes within the grid column. I didn't cover that either. There's certainly other uh, types of physics schemes, convection schemes that generate clouds, but they're different sizes when they, they calculate the statistics across of that. Um, yeah, so there's, there's that too. And there's also another thing where it helps to account for uncertainty is um, through perturbing the tendencies that are the tendencies, so like the, the, the heating and moistening rate from these physics schemes, and per perturbing it a little bit during the time step so that that accounts for that nature as well. Um, which brings me to part of this question about like how does the butterfly effect play a role in all of this? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, so, yeah, so small changes, like I said earlier, small changes um, can certainly induce uh, a large effect once you run the simulation for longer. Um, in, in fact, 
there are there are people at Ankar who studies exactly this, um, the the sort of what we call it the intrinsic predictability. And through those theories, they've through simulations actually using models like MPAS, they've uh, basically identified that the limit of predictability um, is estimated at about 18 days or three weeks ish. And so we are kind of far from that, um, in my opinion. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, in trying to diagnose physics errors and try to improve on our physics errors and improve our forecast. Questions in the room? Uh, very good talk. Thank you. A um, couple questions about, questions about MPAS. First of all, why is the grid hexagonal? Is it a computational thing? Um, so <laughs> that's a good question. So by design, um, we're trying to basically try to make sure, like I mentioned earlier, that the grid cells, they have in a, in a uniform uh, resolution uh, globally. We're trying to make sure that the grid cells are the same size. Um, so I think it's icosahedral grid, which is what the hexagonal grid is called, um, allows for that uh, that that property. Um, and then also then uh, the the development also allowed for refinement over certain regions more gradually too uh, okay. through a special relationship. Yeah. And then if M passes, the plan is to replace the wharf with M pass, right? Eventually. Eventually. Yeah. So I know the wharf I can you know I can run on my desktop. Is that gonna be true for the M pass? Like will I be able to download it on my desktop and run that model? Like on a regional I, I believe there is I think it there is an option to do that. I don't know if it's publicly available. Okay. So yeah. Okay. I've never tried running it just on my laptop. So they're kind of being run on like the supercomputer now or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. okay, gotcha. mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Which brings us to um, Joan's question. Oh no, it went away. Um, sorry. It was. Oof. Let me find that question again. It went away. It was asking, basically. Why are there so many different models? And if they're not all trying to do the same thing? That's not it. We'll find it. <laughs> it's that way. Right, that right. Way. Why are there so many different weather modeling systems in the world? Aren't they all trying to do the same thing? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and I think it's, it's because there are different physics, uh, physics schemes that people have developed, too, across the world. And I think, um, in a way, that's, that's a good thing. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and, and I think um, being able to share some of that development actually across different weather modeling systems is also a desire uh, of the community as well. They might all have their preferred modeling grid because they've um, invest, sorry, yeah, invested in it and have, they, like I said, they all have different properties um, in terms of how they solve the equations. Um, the physics schemes are more modular in the sense that you could you know, put this physics scheme into another model and see how it does, and also maybe pick the best physics scheme for your application as well. And I think um, currently there's no one single physics scheme or a set of physics schemes. Physics suite can um, be performing the best for all of the applications over the globe. So I think um, there's also that regional difference there too. Um, but yeah, so in terms of sharing physics schemes, there's actually a lot of effort in, in that area that's led by NOAA and also working together with NCAR. Uh, the goal is to be able to test and improve our models through the sharing of some of these important components in a weather model. Hi, I really love the talk. Um, so I read in a physics, I'm a physics student, so I put the Lorenz word up there because that's what it made me think of. Uh, it was me. Um, so I'm curious, I read in physics today about how AI, they're trying to start using, or maybe they're already using AI for weather modeling. However, um, this article I read said that the AI could not conceptually understand the butterfly effect or like the, the idea of uncertainty. And so it was consistently just wrong. And so I'm just curious, like, have like and maybe it's not in your area, but um, have you 
is there any like advancement or plans with using AI more with weather, mo weather modeling? And do you think it's going to be more accurate than what humans are capable of? Mm, yeah, million dollar question. <laughs> um, I'm going to be out of a job. That's good. <laughs> so AIs, yeah, it's not my area for sure. Um, but I'll, I'll say first that AI is trained on you know, the analyses that we talked about, the three-dimensional best estimate of the atmosphere. Um, so these AI weather models are trained on these best estimate of the atmos atmosphere. So they have been gaining skills, and especially with the AI technology that's, like, yeah, exploding. Um, but I will say that it's as good as, um, at least my current thinking, is that it will always be as good as what the analyses tell you. And the analyses, as you saw, are dependent on observations, and they use model, a weather model, to fill in the gaps where there are no observations or insufficient observations. Um, so, and also the analysis will only, will also carry, actually I actually didn't talk about this, but will also carry the errors that exist in the weather model. So it'll be affected by that. So I think in the end, um, AI models that are trained on analyses that are also dependent on weather models. So I think there's still that need to improve our weather models to provide better analyses, even if we do go into the AI route because they run way faster than the weather model, um, we still need that weather model component, um, even if AI forecasts become a, the main thing. And they have been improving. Um, I think the main issue is when, we run for, when they run longer and longer into um, the future, the fields are looking smoother and smoother, and they're actively trying to figure out why. I was wondering when you have situations where, you know, the prediction ends up being quite distant from what ends up happening. Is it typically the case that actually what happened in the real world was just one of the ensemble members and it's quite distant from the mean that you're, you know, using perhaps to actually say that the forecast is... <laughs> is <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I can repeat the question. <clears throat> yes, please. So... If you have a situation in which the, the weather forecast ends up being wrong, whatever that means, um, is it typically the case that actually the observations that arise end up just being kind of compatible with one of the ensemble uh, ensembles that you have from one of the various different initial conditions that you've kicked off? Or is it the, sometimes the case that actually none of the different simulations from the, uh, from the weather model are anywhere close to uh, what ends up happening? Yeah. Observations. Yeah. Um, that certainly happens, I think. Um, in fact, for thunderstorms, which is, again, this challenging spatial skill, the smaller the convective storms and thunderstorms forecasts are really challenging. Um, in fact, if you run, um, we often run ensemble simulations because it's so, the uncertainty is so large, um, the spread is often too close together. So you would think, oh, the model must be so confident that this is correct, but really, in reality, they're called under dispersed, so they really, the spread was just insufficient to capture what the truth or the, obs yeah, the observed state is. Um, so yeah, that happens, especially in thunderstorm forecasts, unfortunately, yeah. And, and people are trying to work to, to see how do we better design these uh, perturbations that we talked about. How do we change the initial conditions? How do we change, um, maybe add some stochasticity, stochasticity into the model physics to capture that uncertainty a little bit better of the processes and of the initial conditions so that we could have the ensemble actually capture our observed state. Um, yeah. Okay. I guess this is a bit more um, of a day-to-day -day understanding of, of forecasts. Is there anywhere we can go to understand the uncertainty? So if I, for example, if, if this weekend I want to have a, uh, a barbecue party at my, at my house, and I want to <clears throat> be pretty sure, you know, that it's not going to be horrendously rainy. The forecast says that the weather's going to be great, but actually I know there's uncertainty in these models. Is there a, somewhere I can go to try and understand, you know, maybe the, the, the mean prediction is the weather's going to be great, but there's a 15% chance that the weather's going to suck or anything like that? Is that information yeah. available to the In fact, if you're looking at next day forecast, I would highly recommend the, the NOAA high-resolution forecast, and I can... Um, point you to that. Yeah. Um, we may have a change of direction. Um, um, can you explain one more time the difference between resolve and 
parameterized. Thank yeah. you. I, Processes. It took me many years. To yeah. Say so that many syllables. <laughs> um, uh, yes, of course. Um, so resolve processes, essentially the, the terms in that equation that you can calculate by plugging in the values um, directly from that grid column. So you have a grid column of values, and you have this term, say, A times B. And A and B exist in this grid column. You can just compute that term, A times B, and that'll give you the change in the whatever variable looking at, say, temperature um, with time, and that'll be that driving force. A parameters process is you can't actually, you have A and B in your grid column, the values of it, but you can't, you, it, it's A, the process rate from the, a parameters process might be dependent on some, something else. So you can't actually capture it with just like grid, grid column values. So it could be um, A times B times C. But C doesn't exist in this grid column. So you can't actually calculate that. You need some other approximations. And so this term C, even though it doesn't exist, in, I don't know if it's making it more complicated, but <laughs> the C actually doesn't exist as a grid column, but it's based on, say, observations or uh, field campaigns or something um, that other scientists have focused on studying that particular physical process and estimated that coefficient C to be this value. And now we're going to say, OK, the physics rate, the physics, uh, the change due to this physics is A times B times C. And we feed that back into the weather model. So there are basically processes that you can't um, um, com compute, um, but also can't actually also resolve. Uh, it's smaller. It's, it's smaller than the grid, grid column, grid cell. Sorry. Any more questions in the room? I'll take one last question online before I get to ask my important question. Um, is there a kind of error that affects prediction more than others? Hmm. I think it's, uh, well, this is kind of bias. <laughs> um, but I do think it's in clouds and precipitation processes because it that really does have a lot of, say, Condensation, when clouds are formed, it has this latent heating effect, effect and releases the heat and temperature. The temperature affects you know, pressure and drives winds. And so I think um, the model does have a lot of issues in terms of um, capturing the processes that are in clouds and thunderstorms um, that has a longer term influence on um, other areas, even at the larger scale in the weather patterns that we saw in that week long example. The, one week forecast example. Oh no, there's a competition. <laughs> she won by distance. I have a question about uh, Hurricane Helene. I don't know if you'll be able to answer it or not. Mm. But uh, in the Asheville area, I understand when the rains came up that way, that uh, in certain areas there, there were 24 to 30 inches of rain that fell just in a 24-hour period. And combined with the terrain, the hills and valleys and streams, there's a river that flows right by Asheville. Matter of fact, we've got a relative that lives in that area. Um, was that predicted? I mean, there were it was a catastrophe in that area. 200-something mm -hmm. people died and, and I agree. terrible. Yeah. Do, you, do you know if that was predicted and if they were able to get word out, you know, in a... Mm -hmm. Emergency fashion that everyone needs needs to leave now. That's yeah, I think uh, from what I know, I think the forecasts were actually pretty uh, good, accurate for that, and actually predicted the event. Um, the unfortunate side is it doesn't happen very often. So, I think there's that, that brings up a really important topic: is the perception of forecasts and like how do people use these forecasts um, once they're out there. Um, and then that's actually a whole different area of research. It's actively done at NCAR here, too. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Actually, I just wanted to make a comment when you talked about the effective clouds mm. not being able to anticipate. When we drove here, I did not put in my sunglasses in the car because it was overcast. It took us about five minutes, 10 minutes at the most to get here. And it was sunny. I mean, it, it just shows you how quickly mm -hmm. um, these things change. I can't imagine 
that it's very easy to do this, what you're trying to do for that issue with yeah. the clouds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and certainly there are different types of clouds that are, uh, you know, a lot of different types of clouds <laughs> that are more predictable versus, yeah, uh, harder to forecast for, for sure. Yeah. More questions in the room? Okay. Let me ask you my most important question, which is if there are any students who are watching this today and they want to follow in your footsteps mm -hmm. or do research in the area that you're researching, what advice do you have for them? Mm -hmm. Um, wow. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, I think A, follow your passion. Yeah, if you really love meteorology, I would suggest, um, you know, pursuing a bachelor's degree in atmospheric sciences. Um, you can also do it in physics or math even. Um, combine it with some computer science courses, because I think that's you know, using models to not only just for, do forecasting, but doing a lot of the research is, is, um, is to me, it's fundamental um, to have some computer skills. Um, yeah, try to get some experience with um, computer models early on. I think there are, someone mentioned WARF earlier. WARF is, uh, in my opinion, quite user-friendly. So, <laughs> um, yeah, try to get some research experience um, during your undergrad as well, maybe. Your, um, that opportunity arises and try to work with a professor and see if you know you can get some hands-on experience. Um, I tried to take as many computational courses as I could as an undergrad and graduate student and um, yeah. Let's give May a hand. She did a great job.